Okay, let's get started. So, um, uh, my talk is called Immutability or Putting the Dream Machine to Work. Uh, this talk is about um, applying immutability to user interfaces. Um, uh, these ideas are not new. Uh, they've been applied to disk quite a bit. Um, if, if you use Git, uh, Git uses immutable data structures and immutable trees under the hood. Um, systems like ZFS, the de-duping feature is about sharing structure. Um, also Dropbox uses this trick. That's the reason Dropbox can scale because they also have deduping of files in the cloud. Um, so, uh, but I don't think anybody's thought really hard about applying this to designing user interface programs. And hopefully this talk will convince you that it's a good idea. Uh, it's not necessary to adopt this wholesale, uh, but there may be problems that you encounter in your applications where you might realize after this talk uh, that immutability might be a useful tool. Um, so I work at Cognitect. I've been a JavaScript developer prior to that for about nine years, worked for, working for startups. Um, I was at the New York Times for four. Uh, I worked on some fun stuff like the 2012 election. Uh, so a lot of JavaScript. I recently left to join forces with Cognitect. Uh, Cognitect is a company that does quite a bit of consulting uh, with Fortune 500 companies using uh, their, their particular stack. It happens to be Clojure. Uh, Clojure is an open source programming language. It's a Lisp. It emphasizes immutability. Um, we also maintain Clojure Script when I'm the lead developer. I've been working on it for three years now, which is a uh, dialect of Clojure that compiles to JavaScript. Uh, we also have a product called Datomic, which applies, applies the same sort of ideas to databases. So it's a relational database, uh, and I'm sort of optimized for the cloud uh, that uses immutable data structures on disk. Um, but I'm not going to talk about uh, too much about Clojure, Clojure Script, or Datomic today. I kind of want to talk about the broader idea because I think it has uh, much wider implications than anything language specific. Uh, if you haven't read this book and you're, you're involved in UI programming, um, I think you should probably run to the bookstore and try to find an out-of-print copy. Sadly, it's not in print anymore, uh, but you can get one cheap uh, paperback on Amazon. This is a fantastic book. I encountered it because uh, Alan Kay mentioned it on his mailing list, The Foundations of New Computing. He suggested it because uh, people were asking how did the sort of current state of object-oriented programming as well as um, user interfaces come to be. And this is a very good um, sort of uh, um, history of that time. It sort of centers around this interesting man, JCR Licklider. He was not a computer programmer. He was actually a psychologist uh, and who uh, believed that uh, human factors in psychology would play a huge role. Uh, he wrote two very famous uh, texts. Um, one was called The Man-Computer Symbiosis. So back when uh, computers were primarily, primarily used uh, only by large corporations and by governments uh, for doing, you know, weapon simulations. Uh, he envisioned a future where people would have their own computer and um, all the computers would be networked. And it was uh, his vision and his sort of funneling of government money, U.S. government money, to the right places uh, that allowed um, this sort of computer revolution to happen. Uh, so if you've ever heard of Douglas Engelbart, mother of all demos, where he demoed the first word processor, the first video conference, um, the mouse, uh, all this was because uh, JCR Licklider believed in Douglas Engelbart and thought that he had a um, uh, strong idea of the future. So Licklider, 54 years ago, wrote this uh, book, uh, sorry, paper, paper, it's very short, uh, called The Man-Computer Symbiosis, where he outlines all the things that he thinks that has to happen uh, for the interactive computing revolution to take place. Um, it's actually quite interesting, but uh, I read it like two or three months ago, and something really surprised me uh, that I think is really relevant today. He actually sort of predicts my talk uh, 50 years, 54 years before I did it. Uh, specifically, he's talking about how to structure data and application. And he points out that the tree memory structure uh, invented by Ed Fredkin would be very useful. Um, and basically, uh, it's, it's, it's a very simple tree data structure in which um, the structure is shared. Uh, and we'll see that to great effect. This, this talk is going to be actually quite a bit about data structures, and then we'll see these data structures in action towards the end of the talk. Um, so he, he, he took money and gave money to people like John McCarthy. John McCarthy more or less invented live coding, right? The very first REPL um, Lisp. He invented garbage collection, you know, functional programming, programming with recursive functions. So he is very influential. Uh, to his right is Ed Fredkin who was a um, sort of a college dropout, became a fighter pilot, 
and then was a sort of a, a hardware hacker. He was the guy that could program these very early computers uh, to do impossible things so that they could create these um, first interactive prototypes. But he invented the tree. Uh, sometimes you, will be, you hear it called tri, just to differentiate between tree. But uh, the, the, the word T-R-I-E um, comes from retrieval. And so uh, he says the correct way to pronounce it is tree. Uh, so I will uh, continue to use that. Uh, so Lickletter also uh, created the culture in which money could be funded towards uh, places like Xerox Park. This is Alan Kay, um, you know, sometime in the 70s at Park in front of an Alto that's probably running uh, Smalltalk, uh, the granddaddy of uh, the modern form of object programming as we know it. Uh, at that, around 1979, um, they invented uh, basically, you know, dynamic UIs, and you know, they came up with these ideas, model view controller. Uh, not much has changed. You can actually load up a, a modern Smalltalk VM, and you can light, load up the class browser, the system browser, which shows all classes that are running at runtime, and you will find the words model view controller uh, 35 years ago. Long shadow. Uh, the concept was actually come up, uh, was sort of invented by a Norwegian uh, computer programmer, uh, Trygve Rinskog, and, and it was sort of amended by Adele Goldberg and others, and this was passed around, and this more or less has uh, shaped our idea of UI programming to today. Uh, long shadow. I mean, people are still writing competing MVC frameworks in every language. Uh, so at a very abstract level, I mean, I think this is, this is true because I think MVC is very sound. You have some sort of data model that represents the domain that the user cares about. Um, you need to present the uh, users can't see data structures, right? Even programmers can barely see data structures. So you need to have some visualization, and that's the view. And then often where things get extremely complicated is the controller, uh, which is how do you coordinate what the user sees on the domain that they want to manipulate, you know, which you have re represented in the machine. Um, but I would argue implementations leave much to be desired. So this is the more, I would say, controversial part of my talk. Uh, and that's because MVCs today are you know, primarily designed around stateful objects. Object-oriented programming sort of you know, has this notion that you uh, encapsulate state in objects, but even encapsulating state in objects has uh, very serious problems. If you've done any multi-threaded programming, you are well aware of this. Uh, so this is the data structure part. Um, you might be like, really, a data structure talk. Uh, but hopefully I can make this interesting, uh, because I, I, I doubt many of you have seen uh, how persistent data structures work. Uh, so these slides are not my own. They are from this uh, excellent person, Zach Allen. He is a facilitator at this thing called Hacker School, which is a, like a, a coder's uh, retreat, um, like, a, like a writer's retreat for coders in New York. Uh, so I'm just going to reuse the slides, because they're excellent. Um, so. So even if you are of the object-oriented frame of mind, um, uh, uh, it's not, it's, even if you want to keep doing that style of programming, um, in order to understand why persistent data structures exist, you have to at least step into the shoes of a functional programmer, uh, if only briefly. Uh, so we're going to do that. So functional programmers, they care about mutable objects, immutable objects, not mutable objects. Sorry, immutable values, not mutable objects. Um, and it, you don't really change things. Right? You don't change things. If you want to update a data structure, it, you simply return a new one, leaving the original one uh, unmodified. Uh, so uh, traditionally, in, uh, people have done this with copy and write. And I'm going to demonstrate how you can do it efficiently. Uh, and they're called persistent, which is kind of a conflation of terms. Most of us, when we hear persistent, we think uh, you're going to put it on disk or something. But the, the, it only in this, in this context, it's just saying that you're not destroying the previous value. Uh, and they're fast, and this is extremely uh, new development and within the past decade, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the background for that. But before we get into that, let's, let's talk about the, uh, basically the simplest persistent data structure you can write, which you guys already know about. It's called the linked list. Uh, so you can imagine a list with four elements, and you have uh, some head, and each cell points to the next one. This is something that you learn in CS101. Uh, and, and the neat thing about that is that in 01 time, you can, uh, you know, cons, you know, construct a new list uh, by just, you know, you know, allocating a cell and setting the pointer to the next tail. Uh, what's cool about this is now you have two distinct lists. They represent two different values. But if you look at the sort of layout here on the screen, you see that they share uh, more than 50% of their memory, right? 50% of their memory is shared. Uh, you could uh, get the tail of the X list, and then you could cons another head onto it, and now you have three distinct values. They, you know, they represent three distinct values, but again, they're sharing uh, more than 50% of their memory. Structural sharing, uh, that's what persistent data structures are really about. Uh, 
Well, yeah, structural sharding gives you a few things. It gives you space efficiency. Uh, it also gives you comp computational efficiency. So if you have used copy on write data structures, you'll see how we can be much better than copy on write. Uh, copy on write works when your data structure is very small, but if you have, for example, uh, a very large array, uh, copy on write is going to take, you know, it's ON. Uh, so the ideas that I'm about to present were first sort of um, researched, though not proven, uh, by Phil Bagwell. He invented these data structures called the array map tree and the hash array map tree, and he, and he did this, I believe the last one, maybe both, but at EPFL, which is the home of Scala. Um, but it was really Rich Hickey who took these uh, very cleverly designed data structures and then put an immutable spin on it, and then demonstrated that on modern hardware, uh, you would get much better performance than you would expect. Uh, for example, you would think on paper that something like a finger tree, which is another type of immutable data structure, would be faster. Uh, but simply because of the realities of, of modern runtimes and modern hardware, it's just not true. Uh, um, the data structures I'm going to show completely blow uh, that stuff out of the water. So let's talk about the simplest one, the bitmapped uh, vector tree. And the reason we're going to pick this one, because it's not, it's not too difficult to explain, and it's a data structure which gives you the same properties you're used to from arrays in other languages, or, or kind of like a random access array list. So you're allowed to append efficiently to the end. You can um, randomly access any element, and it has good performance characteristics. Um, so it's very much like an array, except it has this new property in which that you can update it uh, very efficiently without destroying the previous um, whatever value it previously represented, unlike uh, mutable arrays. Uh, so data lives in the trees. Um, it's a prefix tree. We're not, we'll, we'll see diagrams that explain this. It's a bitwise tree, and we'll, we'll see exactly uh, what that means in a second. So how does this work? Um, it's basically um, a persistent uh, bitmap vector tree is just an array of arrays. You pick some size n. Just, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll see what the correct size for n is, but for now we're going to pick a small one because it's easier to show the diagrams. So we're going to pick n equal 4. Um, and every element of this array will point to more arrays of the same dimension. Uh, each one of these arrays will point to another level of arrays of the same dimension. And then finally, you hit um, the leaf nodes that actually contain the values that, are con that you care about. Um, and here, we're just going to use numbers uh, because that's easy to relate the indices um, to the contents. So now the question is, OK, that's interesting, but uh, how do we get anything out of that? So there's this nice property of integers, right? So 106, say we want to find the 106 element. Well, we ha we're fortunate because 106 has a binary representation. And you can bit mask this number to find the thing that you want. Uh, for the particular n that we've uh, chosen here, we need to bit mask two bits. So if the first thing we're going to do is bit mask off the first two bits. And that tells us we have to look at index uh, 1. Uh, this is, you know, zero, uh, zero uh, counting from zero. And then the next two bits tell us we have to look at index two. And the next two bits say index two. And finally, we're out of bits. We know we're, at the, we're nowhere at the end. Uh, and there we have our value, 106 at index two. Uh, so if you know anything about um, uh, modern runtimes, this is extremely fast on the JVM and on JavaScript engines now. We'll, we'll actually see uh, proof. I will show you uh, V8 uh, doing this. Um, so just, it's just a, uh, a couple of array access, uh, accesses and a couple of bit operations. So now that we know how to find something, how do we update something? And this is where we're going to see how we can do much better than copy on write. Um, all we have to do is replace the path uh, that needs to change. So if you want to update the 106th element, and instead of 106, we want to put the string foo, we have to replace the root. We have to replace the array on the path at the next level, the next level, on the next level. And again, we know which ones to replace exactly the same way as we knew how to find something, because the index that we, of the thing we want to replace will get, gives us the path. Um, so what's going to happen is we're going to get a new vector, right? a brand new vector. And it's going to share, like, what, 95% of its contents. All these other arrays that are not colored are shared with the previous value. Uh, and, in, and the last, I'll actually show a demo of a, of a pixel editor that uses this trick to get really fast um, undo uh, and diffing. Uh, so it, it's pretty cool. So what about this size, length 4? It sounds a bit arbitrary. It is. Um, after a lot of testing, people have figured out that 32 is really good. Uh, 32 has a good balance between lookup time and update performance. As you increase the size, basically update takes longer, um, uh, even though the um, lookup times uh, are better. 
So we picked 32, uh, just to give you a sense of how good that is for at least the current state of computing. It, this won't always be true, and we'll probably have to modify them. But today, this number is a very good number. Uh, because if you had a persistent vector that was seven levels deep, that's 32 to the seventh power, that's 34 billion elements. Even if each element was like a 64-bit value on a 64-bit OS, that's about 256 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, you're finally seeing machines in the cloud where you could provision a machine that has that much RAM. Uh, so it's a very good. So that you could actually update an, 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 a persistent vector this large uh, with at most seven array updates. You could find any element in at most uh, seven bit operations and seven array accesses. Again, this is very cheap on modern hardware. You'll often hear the, the phrase that, no, uh, persistent data structures are not 01 to look up, but it's log 32n, uh, which <laughs> it's, it's tiny. It's effectively 01. OK, so let's see a demo. So I, I said that they were fast. Well, let's see if they're actually fast. So this is a, a relatively recent build of V8. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to build up a mutable array on V8. And I'm going to build it. It's basically, I'm just going to build it. It's going to be a thousand elements, I'm sorry, a million elements, just integers. And we're going to do the same thing with a persistent vector. So in the, remember, in the second case, we actually construct one million vectors. This is not the same as pushing onto the array, right? And we'll see how does it perform. This is, this is an old, this is a 2010 laptop. So this is four years old, so it, it's not even that fast. So that should be pretty shocking. It's not even two times slower, even though um, the second one is doing an incredible amount of work over the first one, right? Pretty cool. Uh, so even this would be, oh, they're usable. There are many applications where, where, where being less than 2x slower, uh, because of these other properties that you get, you'd be like, yeah, it's not, the performance doesn't make a difference. If I was writing a JS application, uh, doing, like when I was using jQuery, jQuery find element by CSS ID is 165 times slower uh, than, um, than adding an element to a vector. It's not going to be the bottleneck in your application. But functional programmers have been doing, playing this game for a lot longer than object-oriented programmers, and so we have lots of optimizations in place. Uh, so for example, it's very common to, oops, it's very common to want to build something very quickly. Uh, so we have a really nice operation which takes, allows you to take any trans, uh, immutable vector in 01 time, thaw it into a mutable thing without affecting the original. You can uh, mutate it, and then at the end, when you're done in 01 time, you can get a persistent version of it. Uh, and this performs great. So if there, you find that persistent data structures are a bottleneck and you need a little bit more perf, uh, you can use transients. That's what we call them in Clojure, and there are analogs in other languages. Uh, so. How does it perform now? So on this machine with this particular build, um, you know, it's more than twice as fast to, to build an immutable uh, vector. Uh, and this is, you might be thinking, well, that's V8. Uh, uh, our data structures are optimized for all JavaScript engines, not V8 in particular. And so you can see JavaScript. This is JavaScript core. This is the JavaScript engine in, in Safari. So you can see that JavaScript core is much better at building the array, but it doesn't really matter. We still beat uh, the mutable array in this case uh, by using transient vectors. So good perf. So now that we, and, and this, is, this stuff is only going to get better. Um, I, you know, I've been following JavaScript for a long time. I mean, the, the amount of optimization that's being poured into JavaScript engines is pretty wild. It's probably we've never seen uh, this much money being going into optim optimizing one language. Uh, there's a whole bunch of research that has, um, is in the design of JavaScript core, SpiderMonkey, um, and um, uh, V8 that's really cool. And the, it's only going to get better because you have this desire to um, uh, basically get the, to the performance of C in the browser. Uh, games, games are sort of driving this. There's a whole initiative called Asm.js that Firefox did. And the other, the other engines don't want to do it. They want to achieve that performance dynamically without AOTing this weird JavaScript variant. Uh, so only, uh, our stuff is only going to get faster. So OK, now that you guys know about persistent uh, data structures, or at least one form of them, um, you can, uh, you'll, you'll have some interesting real realizations, as I had about seven months ago. Um, I realized that Facebook's React, which I ignored, which was released about a year ago, actually had this amazing hook 
where I could attach persistent data structures and basically make React faster than it is out of the box. If you attach, if you use persistent data structures with React, um, it's just faster. Uh, and we'll see why. And you get some other neat things out of that as well. So Ohm basically takes ClojureScript and it takes React and it sort of shows that we can, you can build interesting, responsive, efficient uh, user interfaces that um, actually make many hard things easier to do. Um, and we'll see that. So if, you have, if you're not familiar with React, React is sort of up and coming. Um, a lot of people are probably more familiar with things like Angular or Backbone or um, uh, 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 what? Ember. Ember. Um, but those, those things are fine. Those things are great. And in fact, those probably can be modified to do some of the things that I'm demonstrating. But React is definitely makes integration of immutable data structures the simplest. So well, how does React work? React is sort of designed around this sort of uh, interesting batch rendering sort of concept. You know, they, it sort of treats the browser as a sort of GPU. So in a GPU, you really don't want to send individual instructions to the GPU because that's very slow. Uh, you want to batch as much as you can and send one big message. And so what React does, because that's really annoying to do by hand. In fact, if you ever see highly optimized DOM code, people do this stuff by hand. So React says, that's a pattern. We're going to design our framework uh, using this thing called the virtual DOM, and we'll do that batching for you. Uh, basically, uh, React looks like an object-oriented thing, but it really was designed by, with sort of by a functional programmer. The guy uh, that did this, the original concept, was by somebody who was a fan of functional programming. But what it lets you do is it lets you take your data, your JavaScript data, you apply a view function, and then it computes a virtual DOM. Um, if you have new data, you apply that function, and it, comp it computes a completely new virtual DOM. That's how it works at a high level. There are many optimizations in place to prevent computing the entire tree, and, but it's irrelevant. Conceptually, that is how it works. It, it produces a virtual DOM as your, as your values change that represent the entire application. Um, and how it changes the DOM, as it says, we can take the virtual DOM we calculated at time zero and the virtual DOM that we calculated at time one, and that will give us the minimal set of changes to apply to the DOM. What's cool about this is that in this world, unlike what anything you've probably used before, if I just flip those two virtual DOMs, React will give me the reverse set of changes right, for free. I don't have to do that. I don't do anything. React will simply compute the reverse set of changes. And, and we'll see uh, demos that take, uh, take advantage of that. OK. So I, I had sort of, <coughs> I, wrote a, I wrote a blog post like um, in January, and it was very popular. It was like, I don't know, I think I got 150,000 uniques in like a week. Um, and it totally changed people's perspective of React. Uh, React is quite popular now. Um, but I, but I, I, I sort of postulated that doing undo was, was now trivial, uh, which is classically in object-oriented systems is a like big pain in the butt. You don't want to add it later. Um, and I said, if you organize your entire application state around a mutable data structure, undo is free. There's nothing you have to do. You can jump to any point in time in your application state, um, and React will be able to render it fairly quickly. Uh, so this uh, developer at, at Ableton, Ableton Live, the musical software, a UI developer there, read my blog post and said, you know, I want to see if this guy is like serious. He's, this doesn't sound like you could really do this. And so he set out to prove to himself that it could be done. And he built a really great little application. It's a 64 by 64 pixel editor. And what he did was he put all of the pixels uh, for that you draw, the frame that you draw into, into an immutable vector. And he wanted to show that, you know, demonstrate that he basically get infinite undo, infinite redo. It would be memory efficient. The application wouldn't slow down. Um, that he could use the persistent data structures to get you know, trivial exporting of animated GIFs, uh, and so on. And so let me show that right now. Uh, so here it is running in, um, make sure this is going to work. OK, so here it is. Make this a little bit bigger. Uh, so it's, it's a cool little app. It's, 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 it's actually quite a bit of code. It's like, I think, a 2,000 line application. It's not simple. Uh, he spent quite a bit of time on it. But I can, I can pick a color. Uh, I can draw a little, little halo around this, this funny little character. On the right side of the screen, that's the history. Uh, I can. Undo, I can redo. And even if I do this, right, I'm clicking one pixel. These are all getting recorded as undo steps. And you could do this all day, and it's, you know, it's going to be relatively efficient, uh, which is pretty cool. So um, 
It's very, it's, very, it's very nice, and also over here you can see that I can scrub, I can scrub the history, and it's also responsive, right? He's actually, he's actually using the fact that this is all stored as persistent data structures. So you're probably wondering, well, how complicated was this part, right? The part that's the hardest, and the part that people don't do. They just, you know, you get to undo, and you're like, ah, don't, we don't care. It's not a big deal. Uh, so this is his, his entire file to implement undo. Um, 60 lines of code. This is playback, this is undo, redo, um, and the exporting to animated GIF. Uh, that's awesome, right? This is really cool. Something that's classically hard to do uh, with persistent data structures, pretty straightforward. Uh, and then you're probably, if you're performance-minded, you're probably wondering, uh, well, what about memory usage? So this is, so I, I, for, just for fun, I said, well, I'm going to take a persistent vector which has 4,096 elements, and I'm going to snapshot 1,000 of them. Basically, I'm going to store them in a, in a, in a, in a root variable so that they get, um, they're, they're, they're pinned, uh, so that I can do a, a heap snapshot. Uh, Google Chrome DevTools has an awesome heap snapshot. It shows you exactly how much memory your JavaScript application is using. And so I, I snapshot it at 1,000 frames. And then I took a, an array with 4,096 elements, and I randomly updated. But of course, I had to copy on write. I had to copy on write every array, because if I wanted the, the same uh, behavior, that's what you had to do. Uh, to do 1,000 snapshots took 2 tenths of a megabyte with persistent vectors. On the right, you see that it took about 1.7 megabytes if I used copy on write with arrays. So it's nearly an order of magnitude uh, memory saving. So it's not just speed. Uh, it, it also is very efficient uh, in memory. Um, so, of course, people often misconstrue what I'm saying as like undo, redo. Well, that, that, that's great, but it doesn't apply to all applications. Uh, and people often don't understand that this is not about undo or redo. This is about um, very powerful state management. If you have modals, if you have a multi-step form where the user can press the back button, and you don't want to lose anything, and you don't want to have to do an extra persist to the server just so that they can click the back button and their form fields are pre-filled, right? Persistent data structures, you can, you, can, you can step through time. You can even allow somebody to go backwards in their form, change your form, and then propagate those, those changes forward through history. So if you've ever done any Git magic, anything that you think is really cool, like with fancy Git tricks, you can do this in memory in your interactive application. Uh, so it's, it's much bigger than undo redo. It's about powerful state management tools. Uh, to the extreme, you, uh, you have things like, um, an extreme case of this is uh, Elm. So I'm sure as many of you have seen um, uh, Brett Victor's talks. So Brett Victor's talks are really cool, but they're just prototypes, they aren't real. And so people at the end of his talks are all like, oh, you know, that's what I want, but it doesn't actually work. So, uh, it's been interesting to see actually the, the functional, so sort of functional JavaScript and compiled to JavaScript um, people actually taking, trying to do the real version of this. And Elm is a, is a sort of functional programming language that targets JavaScript that also emphasizes immutability. And so they were also able to, with not too much effort, write, um, uh, uh, modify their IDE so that they use a persistent data structure to snapshot the state of the entire application. And you hit a bug, and you can basically pause and it's been recording everything, and you have a slider. And you can actually slide the slider, see what values are wrong, change, change your values on the fly, change your program on the fly. That will get hot-loaded, modify the states that, that, that the program is aware of, and you, know, you can edit and continue. Uh, so all this, like he's, he's going to modify, I think, the gravity. Yeah, pretty cool. So there are lots of possibilities, uh, not just the ones I've talked about. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna basically almost getting towards the end. So if you want to play around with this and you're a JavaScript developer, um, you're interested in this type of thing, I wrote something two years ago now called Mori. It actually takes the entire ClojureScript standard library and presents it as a normal JavaScript library. You can include it the way you would include anything else. It's pretty nice. It's a, it's a fun way to play with it. Um, it's actually quite popular on, uh, in the Node community now, relatively speaking. It gets basically... 8,000 downloads a month, which is not bad. So uh, finally, people are warming up to it. When I announced this two years ago, like you know, for a year, I got zero downloads. Uh, but I've been doing a lot of talks in the JS community about it, and people are starting to see, yes, this is valuable sometimes, and that's really cool. Uh, Facebook now, because of I've been blogging so much about how awesome immutability is when you pair it with React, they actually are making their own idiomatic immutable data structure library. So Facebook is doubling down on immutable data structures because they, they want users of React 
to pair them with immutable data structures. In fact, if, if you could convince all JavaScript developers to do this, I mean, React would just get four times faster, right? It would just for free if you could get everybody to use immutable data structures. Um, and then you're probably wondering, well, if I use immutable data structures, that's really cool, but I have to use JSON. So how do you get immutable data structures from your server to the client? So we've already solved this problem at Cognitech for you too. We have a cool library called Transit, which piggybacks on JSON, and I wrote a blog post um, on actually uh, changing transit so that you could read um, a value off the wire, and instead of getting immutable arrays and immutable um, uh, objects, you get immutable JS um, vectors and maps. So, and it's fast, it's not slow. Immutable JS has the right hooks so that we can construct these things very quickly. So it's a very small overhead over JSON. And so who's using this? So actually, Prismatic, which is pretty big now, I think they actually have 10 engineers or something working on an Ohm application. They really like it. I mean, the thing that they like is that Ohm gives them, gives them a very good story for reasoning about the code. They're, you know, it's not a code base where typically in JavaScript, like, you don't know what's mutating what. And, and their application there, it's, it's very clear. If they, need, if they need some sort of state change, where it's happening. Meteor.js, which is really popular, uh, doesn't actually export Mori, but they use, they've also found a use case for um, um, uh, Mori inside of the dependency uh, resolution system. Their package manager uh, uses a constraint solver, and it uses Mori under the hood so that this to get like a 50% performance boost. Uh, Circle CI, which is you know a reasonable, some semi-popular uh, continuous integration service. They all use, they use Ohm on the front end. And of course, there's a, all these other companies that use ClojureScript uh, that are already sort of sold on immutable data structures. But it's really exciting to see that, again, this is uh, coming to JavaScript, and JavaScript people are, are also excited about it as well. Uh, so th there's some links. These, po these slides will be available. I recommend checking them out. Um, and I think that's all I have. I can take questions. So, uh, how do you deal with, uh, with animations? Do, do, do every frame in the animation as, uh, as a, step, a step, or is it just like from one stage to another stage the same time? So, uh, what I was alluding to early on is that you can pick your strategy, right? So, actually, um, in, in Goya, when I'm scrubbing, I mean, that's an animation. So all he's doing is he, he so it's not like you're going to stop using mutation, right? That's not going to happen. So he just takes each vector and he blitz it onto the canvas. So it's just a you take grab a vector, you know, go through every element, and in the for loop, the for loop just mutate the canvas. Uh, you you will use the same techniques for animation. So what kind of data structures do you have ready made immutable uh, implementations for? I'm sorry. So, what kind of data structures? So, you showed, you know, vectors. Oh, okay. So, which, which, what data structures do we have? We have sorted maps. We have sorted sets. Uh, we have um, sets. We have maps, um, vectors, um, queues, linked lists. I think that's it. Yeah. We're also very clever. I mean, so the thing is that, uh, you know, we like. Honestly, some of these things that you use, there's like five data structures involved because you want to swap out the right one for the particular usage pattern so that you don't have to worry about it. Other questions? No? Okay, thank you. <laughs>